Now, two things most of us know about climate change is that A, through the burning of fossil fuels, whether or not cars, for heating, or for electricity production, we are collectively releasing huge quantities of carbon dioxide gas each year. And that B, this gas is contributing to the greenhouse effect, heating the earth and increasing global temperatures. But what else can science tell us about climate change, about where we're currently at, what changes we're seeing, and where we might be headed? How do scientists study the problem, and how much can they tell us about the future? Well, to speak about this and other questions, we decided to call up Michael Mann, one of the most respected climate scientists in the world. He's the author of more than 180 peer-reviewed and edited publications, and was the lead author on one of the chapters for the third United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Report, which was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. As a scientist, Michael Mann is perhaps best known for his work in reconstructing temperatures of past centuries, before accurate human thermometer measurements were available by using data collected from the environment, such as tree rings and ice cores. This pioneering work led to the famous hockey stick graph, which showed global temperatures over the course of the last millennium and demonstrated how rapidly the climate started to warm with the onset of the Industrial Revolution. The graph and its findings were featured widely in the third UN report on climate change, and the results have since been corroborated by many further studies. Michael Mann is a distinguished professor of meteorology at Penn State University, where he's also the director of the Earth System Science Center. I reach Professor Mann by Skype. Michael Mann, welcome to The Elephant. Thanks. It's good to be with you. Now, you're one of the, the leading scientists within climate change. And for our audience, I kind of wanted to just get an overview, like at a really basic level, say a, a human adult who was frozen in time woke up in 2015, or you had to explain to an interested anthropologist from Mars the problem of climate change and, and what we know, what the science tells us. How would you explain it to them? Uh, sure. Well, what I would say is the greenhouse effect which is at the core of human-caused global warming and climate change. Um, this isn't controversial science. We've known about it for two centuries. And since you mentioned Mars, whether it's Mars or Venus or any of the other planets in our solar system, we would not be able to explain the climates on those planets as well as we can if it were not for our understanding of the greenhouse effect. So the scientific basics uh, uh, behind climate change are, are very fundamental. They're very clear. They're not debated seriously within the scientific community. Uh, the fact that the globe is warming as a result of these increasing greenhouse gas concentrations from fossil fuel burning, that is not contested within the world's scientific community. Nor is the fact that this represents a threat already, and, and it will represent an even greater threat to our environment, to uh, society, to civilization, if we do nothing to uh, deal with the problem of uh, ongoing burning of carbon and these growing levels of greenhouse gas concentrations. You know, the, the concentration of, of greenhouse gases of, of carbon dioxide is currently at above 400 parts per million. Can you put that into context? What does that mean uh, in terms of both the outcomes and looking back at, at human history and, and past eras? Yeah. Uh, so th the fact that we've now crossed 400 parts per million CO2 in the atmosphere, we have fairly strong evidence that we have not seen CO2 concentrations that high in literally millions of years. Um, so we have to go back in time well past the dawn of human civilization uh, to find greenhouse gas concentrations that were anywhere near that high, probably, again, three, four, maybe five million years. That drives home the fact that we are engaged in an unprecedented and uncontrolled experiment with the one planet that we know can support life. Um, and that's a very dangerous thing to be doing. You know, the fact that uh, CO2 concentrations are increasing so rapidly is really the problem. Uh, there's no question that there have been times in Earth's deep ge geological past say, 100 million years ago during the early Cretaceous period, um, uh, we know CO2 concentrations, greenhouse gas concentrations, were higher at that time. But those long-term variations in the concentrations of these gases took place on timescales of 100 million years. Uh, we are making similar increases in the concentrations of these gases on a time scale of a hundred years, a million times faster. And that's really the problem. We are raising the concentration of greenhouse gases and warming the planet and changing the climate at a far faster rate than human beings or living things have ever had to deal with in the past. And there's no reason to believe 
that we have the adaptive capacity to uh, deal with changes that continue to take place that rapidly. Now, one of the things that you're best known for is sort of projecting temperatures back into the past, sort of looking at, at the record and, and then building them up to today to, to track the temperature increases we're seeing as a result of the carbon dioxide buildup in the atmosphere. Can right. you explain just like at a fundamental level, like how, how do you actually do that? How, what sort of tools or data uh, points do you, do you use to, to try to figure out what uh, temperatures were in the past? Uh, sure. So I, I think you're alluding to the, the so-called hockey stick curve, which is this curve that my co-authors and I published a decade and a half ago. It became uh, somewhat iconic in the climate change debate uh, because, you know, you didn't need to understand the complicated uh, physics of how the climate system works or how a climate model works to understand what this graphic was telling us, that the changes that we're seeing today in, in temperature are unprecedented as far back as we can go. And by implication, it probably has something to do with human activity. Um, but this graph is based on using information like tree rings and corals and ice cores, uh, natural archives that tell us something about how the climate changed in the deep past. We can take these so-called proxy records and piece together a picture of how the climate varied prior to the relatively brief uh, interval in time, really only about the past century, where we have widespread human observations, widespread thermometer measurements, widespread uh, instrumental data. Um, if we want to get a sense of how unusual the warming we've seen over the past century really is, we need to extend the record back in time using these sorts of data. And back in uh, the late 1990s, my co-authors and I uh, published an attempt to extend the record of uh, the average temperature over the northern hemisphere back uh, initially six centuries and eventually uh, back a thousand years. And what that record shows is that there were some temperature changes prior to the Industrial Revolution. Um, temperatures were relatively moderate, warm, a thousand years ago uh, for the northern hemisphere on the whole, and they declined in subsequent centuries as we uh, entered into the so-called Little Ice Age. But then, uh, when we get to 1800 or so, when we get to the beginning of the 19th century, temperatures begin to spike upward. Um, and indeed, by the end of the 20th century, they reach levels that are unprecedented over the entire uh, length of the record. And so if you imagine this curve, uh, it looks a little bit like a, a so-called hockey stick. It's a long handle, gently sloping downward, followed by a very rapid upward spike, if you like the blade of the hockey stick. And so the curve got that name. Um, this placed me and my co-authors sort of in the center of the climate change debate because it became such an iconic result. And, the, and critics who want to try to discredit the science of climate change have been trying to tear this graph down uh, for years by attacking me, by attacking my co-authors. Um, but in fact, what we now have is a, a veritable hockey league, if you will, uh, because there are dozens of studies now that come to precisely the same conclusion. And the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has come to the same conclusion. So this really now appears to be a widely accepted result, but it's just one piece of the puzzle. Uh, you could get rid of the hockey stick, you could get rid of the entire uh, so-called hockey team, if you like, all of these uh, paleoclimate reconstructions, and we would still have many different independent, solid pieces of evidence that point to the fact that the globe is warming, the climate is changing, human activity is responsible for it, and um, it's already a problem, and it will become a worse problem if we ignore it. And, and what are some of those other signals? So you know, when we talk about global warming, we're really referring to the warming of, of surface temperatures, but that's just one diagnostic, if you like, just one measure, one metric of human-caused climate change. Because with these increasing greenhouse gas concentrations, along with the warming of the surface, we have that warmth penetrating down into the oceans, where it is causing the oceans to expand, contributing to sea level rise, uh, combined with the melting of ice, the melting of ice sheets and glaciers, um, and that meltwater runs off into the ocean and that further raises sea level. So we have global sea level rise is another metric of climate change. Uh, then we have shifting patterns of winds and oceans. And uh, my uh, co-author, uh, Stefan Ramstorff of the University of Potsdam, 
um, and I and a number of other scientists uh, published an article in the journal Nature Climate Change a few months ago uh, showing that the so-called conveyor belt ocean circulation that warms the North Atlantic to some extent, that helps warm Europe, um, appears to be slowing down already. Now that was one aspect of climate change that was long predicted. Um, we now have evidence that it's actually happening. We have shifting wind patterns and patterns of atmospheric circulation, which in turn lead to shifts in rainfall and drought. More heat extremes, more extreme uh, heat waves that are longer, uh, that have a greater duration and a larger magnitude, uh, temperatures are warmer than anything we've seen before. So I could go on and on. Uh, there are literally hundreds of uh, atmospheric and oceanic variables that are being impacted by climate change. And in many cases, those changes aren't just variables in the climate model. Um, they are things that matter to, to human beings. They impact us when it comes to resources, food and water and land and national security and many other measures of uh, sort of the, the quality of our lives. So, so we've, we've already started to see the, the impacts. Yeah, we, we've seen the impacts already. And in fact, by some estimates, some credible estimates by leading economists, climate change uh, related damages are already costing us more than a trillion dollars, a trillion US dollars in global domestic product uh, GDP, a, a trillion dollars or on the order of, you know, a tri in, the, in the neighborhood of a trillion uh, euros uh, damage being done uh, each year by climate change. That's a whole lot more than it would cost right now to take action, to, to do something about climate change. Uh, countries like Germany are actually leading the way by increasing a larger and larger share of renewable energy into their energy portfolios. I believe Germany now gets something like 30% of its uh, energy from uh, renewable sources. Um, that's, you know, what the rest of the world needs to do if we are going to avert catastrophic changes in our climate. I just want to quickly go back to casting back into the, the past, uh, the, the modeling of what temperatures were in the past. Sure. Um, I, I imagine that's such a big problem because you just have a, a tree ring here, an ice core there. Could you just talk about the actual scale of uh, how you sure. are actually able to find these different samples and make that into something coherent? Because I, I, I can't imagine what that's actually like to, to put that all together. Sure, it's, it's a lot of work. And in fact, you know, in some sense, the easy job is you know my job or the job of other scientists who try to use all this information to reconstruct past climate. The hard work is actually out in the field. Um, the hundreds, in fact, by now probably thousands of, of scientists, of climate scientists, of paleoclimatologists who have gone to some of the most remote locations on Earth, uh, Antarctica, you know, the Arctic Circle, um, Greenland, uh, the highest mountains in, in the tropics, Mount, Mount Kilimanjaro in Africa, um, up into the, the Andes um, to get ice cores from the tropics. A pretty amazing thing. If you go high enough in elevation to the top of these uh, tropical mountains, you can get ice cores uh, that tell us something about how climate was changing right at the equator. Uh, we can also get ice core information in uh, the polar regions, as I uh, was alluding to before. Um, then over the continents, we can get information from tree rings because tree growth under certain conditions is pretty strongly limited by climate conditions, by rainfall, how much rainfall uh, a region gets in uh, the extremity of temperatures, um, how, how warm or cold temperatures get. Uh, these have an impact on tree growth. And so if you look at the annual bands of trees and you collect lots of these records and you make a composite, you can actually really start to see the climate signals in these records. You can see volcanic eruptions uh, in these records. You can see uh, El Nino uh, events in, in these records. And so you, these tree rings uh, begin to give you information over the continental regions in middle latitudes. If, if you go too far towards the tropics, uh, it turns out that um, trees don't tend to have strong annual banding, and so you lose that chronology that's so important. If you go to the poles, well, there are no trees. Um, right. So, so it trees, only works in, a, in a, a certain band, I guess. Yeah, exactly, in a latitude band of the middle latitudes. But in the tropics, you know, we've got corals, and, and the isotopic uh, content of a coral's uh, calcite skeleton 
Um, the isotopes of oxygen that make up that calcium carbonate skeleton that we think of when we think of corals, well, the relative abundance of the different isotopes of oxygen is a function of the seawater, of the salinity and the temperatures of the seawater. So you can start to see where you're filling in the gaps. In the tropics, the corals tell us um, about what the oceans are doing. At the poles, we've got ice cores. Um, and how do the ice cores work? What 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 can we find out by by digging up the ice cores? Exactly? Yeah, uh, great question. Um, you know, you can uh, look at the ice core first of all and just see how much accumulation there was of ice in a given year when you have that annual banding, and it tells you about changes in in precipitation. In that case, uh, in the solid form of snow and ice. But again, the isotopes turn out to be. Uh, where the real interesting detective work gets done because the isotopes of oxygen in water, water also has oxygen, it's H2O, and those oxygen atoms in the water have a distribution of isotopes. And the relative abundance of those two isotopes turns out to relate to temperatures locally where the snowfall occurred. It can also tell us about uh, changes in uh, sea level on very long time scales. So we can actually reconstruct the, the ice ages. We can see the ice ages coming and going uh, in these ice cores. So there's a wealth of climate information that's potentially available in each of these sources. And when you start to piece them all together, you begin to build a global picture. And there are various methods that we you know, developed our own methods. Other scientists have used uh, al alternative approaches to taking all the information, the collective information in this vast array of proxy data and forming a, a reconstruction of climate with them. Um, and th there's a whole science there um, that is decades old and uh, has, you know, again, there are hundreds of scientists who've worked in this area and there are many different estimates now um, using these sorts of data of how the climate has changed back in time. And the interesting thing is, even though you know our original hockey stick uh, curve is a decade and a half old now, uh, the main conclusions of our, our study from the late 1990s hold up remarkably well in the increasingly more sophisticated and uh, more robust efforts that um, have been made in more recent years using more widespread data, using, uh, again, more sophisticated methods. The basic picture uh, remains the same. The, the warming we're seeing today really is unprecedented as far back as we can go. Uh, one study has now tentatively reconstructed the average temperature of the Earth uh, back into the last ice age and finds that the recent warming spike right now has no precedent as far back as we can go, uh, back even into the last ice age. There's often this talk about uh, consensus or non-consensus among scientists, especially in American media. How would you characterize the debate or non-debate uh, among scientists? Is there any debate about global warming? So that's a great question because uh, there is this huge gulf, first of all, between where sort of scientists stand on the basic question, you know, is global warming happening? Is it caused by human activity? Um, there's anywhere from a 97 to a 99 percent consensus among uh, scientists publishing in the peer-reviewed scientific literature that global warming is real and it's caused by human activity. So that isn't something that's seriously debated in the scientific literature. It isn't something that's seriously debated um, at scientific meetings. And yet the public continues to have this perception that scientists are somewhat divided on those questions, in part because there has been a massive, very well-funded, very organized misinformation campaign by certain fossil fuel interests, those who don't want to see us uh, regulate carbon emissions, those who profit uh, tremendously right now from the unregulated burning of fossil fuels. Um, they have, in many cases, sought to stymie efforts you know, to, to introduce policies to, to deal with this problem here in the U.S. Um, and they have engaged in a massive uh, disinformation campaign, really, uh, to try to fool the public, the American public, um, into thinking that there isn't a scientific consensus. Um, it's very much like what was done by the tobacco industry decades ago when faced with the prospect of the public learning of the, of the very negative uh, health impacts of their product. Um, in fact, some of the same paid advocates who were advocating for tobacco interests in the 1980s uh, 
are now advocating for fossil fuel interests uh, in trying to uh, discredit the mainstream science of climate change, in trying to uh, undermine the public's uh, understanding of that science. But the fact is that scientists are uh, debating a number of very interesting questions. We're not debating whether global warming is real or caused by human activity. Uh, that bus left the station, you know, m more than a decade ago. That doesn't mean that we've answered all the interesting questions. There are wide open questions that have implications for uh, policy, for adaptation, for example. Um, how, you know, much worse will Atlantic hurricanes get? We don't yet have a firm answer to that question. You know, how bad will drought in California get over the next couple decades? Again, there's some spread in scientific thinking on that issue. So when you get down into some of the details, um, precisely how much will the globe warm as a result of ongoing you know, burning of fossil fuels and ongoing increases in greenhouse gas concentrations, there are a range of estimates because there are uncertainties in, in some of the physical processes that are involved, like uh, the role that clouds might play. That turns out to be a pretty difficult problem because clouds are really small, the global climate models we use are really big, and so it can be difficult to represent clouds as accurately um, as we might like to in some of these models, and different physical assumptions about the role that clouds play therefore lead to somewhat different uh, estimates of how much warming we'll see. But you can take all of that scientific uh, uncertainty that exists, and it cuts both ways. Yes, certain projected impacts could perhaps be less than the models currently predict, but other impacts could be far worse. And the evidence that's come in over the last decade or so seems to be weighing in, in many respects, on the side of the models actually understating uh, the rate at which things are happening. The models haven't been capturing the rate at which we are losing Arctic sea ice um, in the summer. Uh, the models uh, have underpredicted the rate at which the ice sheets will continue to melt. Um, the climate models predicted that we wouldn't see a loss of ice from the Greenland and the Antarctic ice sheets for many decades to come, but the satellites are measuring that loss already. It's already happening decades ahead of schedule. And, and there are many such examples. So it turns out uncertainty, uh, while it exists and while it drives a lot of the research, we don't keep on researching answers uh, questions that uh, have been more or less answered. What drives researchers are answering the questions that remain open. But it turns out that the uncertainty that remains uh, because of those open questions could well mean that climate change ends up being even worse than we currently project. And so it is not by any stretch of the imagination a cause for complacency or an argument for inaction. If anything, Uncertainty is an argument for taking even greater action because of the potential outcome where the changes end up being far worse than we currently estimate. Right. I guess, as you've said, it's a, it's a big experiment we're, we're conducting and uh, we, we don't exactly know uh, what's going to happen. That's right. To put it starkly, I mean, if we do nothing, paint me a picture of the type of world that we're headed towards. Yeah, well, I, I don't have to because Hollywood has already done that for us. Um, and, and I'm only half joking uh, when I say that movies like uh, Mad Max or The Road, um, uh, even Soylent Green, um, a movie from the early in, or the mid 1970s starring Charlton Heston, that movie was premised on the dystopian future that would arise uh, because of global warming. Um, the, the movie actually, early on in the movie, there's a reference to, to global warming as the reason for this uh, post-apocalyptic you know, society. So, you know, Hollywood has actually done a, a pretty good job of portraying the worst case scenarios. And, and why I say that is if you look at this, the dystopian, you know, Hollywood post-apocalyptic visions, they are eerily similar to the sort of bleak picture that is painted by national security experts. Um, there was a, a report, um, uh, I don't know, now, almost six or seven years ago, called the Age of Consequences. It was by leading national security experts uh, here in the U.S. And they looked at various potential scenarios that could result from human-caused climate change. And many of the scenarios 
that they explored end up sounding a lot like the scenarios that we see in these dystopian Hollywood movies. Um, interestingly enough, in a speech that our president, uh, President Barack Obama, gave yesterday at, uh, I believe it was the Air Force uh, Academy, he talked about uh, climate change as being perhaps the leading national security threat we face now here in the U.S. Um, and for a very simple reason. You take decreasing food, water, and land, combine that with an increasing global population, and you have a toxic mix of factors, a perfect storm, if you will, that will lead to potential instability and conflict. Uh, there's a reason that our military refers to climate change as a threat multiplier. It takes all of those existing threats and makes them worse because there are even less resources, people competing for fewer resources when it comes to food, water, land. I, I want to get back to a few more scientific questions. But first, uh, I, I just want to ask you about, I mean, you've written a whole book about sort of the, the climate war that you found yourself at the center of, uh, the hockey stick and the climate wars. I mean, you've faced a lot of personal flack and, and, and personal tax yeah. as a result of this sort of faux debate, I guess. Yep. Could you talk about that? Like, what, just what was the impact on your, on your personal life in, in, in starting to, to share the results of your work and portray it to the media? Yeah, uh, thanks. It, yeah, it's, um, you know, I, I'm, a, you know, at heart, a science nerd. You know, I, I double majored at UC Berkeley in applied math and physics, went off to graduate school at Yale University to pursue theoretical physics um, in the late 1980s. And it, it just happened that that was a time when uh, funds were actually fairly scarce in theoretical physics and a lot of physicists were looking for other areas of science where they could apply the math and physics skills that they had to problems that were really interesting and where there was frankly there was funding to work on them and as it happened uh, climate modeling was one of those areas and so I ended up switching um, departments I switched into the Department of Geology and Geophysics at Yale University and ended up doing my PhD with a guy named Barry Saltzman on climate modeling and it led me down a path that I never could have foreseen. I uh, ended up pursuing a line of inquiry that eventually led me to look at these uh, climate proxy records that we talked about earlier um, and ultimately led us to try to reconstruct past climates using these records and it led to this curve, the, the hockey stick curve, which was almost just a byproduct of that research but it took on a life of its own. Once we published the hockey stick curve and once it you know, was featured in the summary for policymakers of the third assessment report of the IPCC in 2001, whether I liked it or not, even though it was the last thing that I had ever signed up for, I was a public figure. And there were people who were going to try to take me down personally in a cynical effort to discredit this iconic graph, the hockey stick curve to try to convince the public that somehow the entire weight of evidence for human-caused climate change rested on one study by one person, me, when in fact I had co-authors on that study. And in fact, if our study had never been published, uh, there would be every bit as much scientific evidence that climate change is real and it's caused by human activity and it's a problem. But it provided a useful scapegoat, um, a useful you know, straw man. Uh, for the critics who were looking to try to uh, confuse the public, um, to raise doubt in the public mindset, to get the public to um, to lose their faith in the scientists. And what did that look like? I mean, uh, what were you actually, what, what sort of attacks uh, did you face? Just about anything, <laughs> everything you can imagine, you know, con hostile congressional inquiries, where I was in the hot seat in the congressional hearings um, with politicians, uh, fossil fuel industry funded politicians uh, trying to uh, ridicule me and, and, and attack me in public. Um, uh, James Inhofe, who's the leading climate change denier in the U.S. Senate, uh, uh, perhaps most famous now for um, having introduced a snowball <laughs> on the Senate floor this winter as if that was evidence that climate change was a hoax. Um, he uh, had me uh, testify in a hostile uh, Senate hearing back in 2003 where he had two climate change deniers um, trying to tear down my work. Uh, uh, then in uh, 2000. And five, 
uh, Joe Barton, a congressman from Texas who happens to be, or at least at the time, with the largest recipient in the U.S. House of Representatives of fossil fuel money from a fossil fuel state, tried to subpoena all of my personal emails um, to look for something to discredit me with. It goes on and on. Plus, you know, there are these um, industry-funded front groups and they're sort of paid attack dogs who write nasty uh, commentaries, uh, op-eds in newspapers, uh, attacking me and, and other climate scientists. Um, and uh, I've, you know, I've received not just angry emails and letters and death threats against me, but threats against my family. I've had, I had a white powder sent to me in the mail. It required uh, having the FBI investigate the matter. Um, and it turned out it was um, just, uh, it, it wasn't anything uh, dangerous, uh, but it's still a felony offense to try to intimidate somebody by sending them something that's supposed to appear to be a, a dangerous substance. Um, they never caught the person. This is just, you know, and it goes on and on. This is the, the life that you lead if you are a climate scientist who is prominent in the public discourse over this issue. You will be subject to these sorts of threats and attacks. You have to sort of grow a thick skin. Um, in my case, um, it simply has emboldened me. Um, the fact that... It hasn't, um, been, it hasn't been hard or discouraging? Uh, at times it is, but if it was meant to, to cause me to retreat into my lab um, and to retreat from the, from the fray, from the public discourse, uh, it has probably had the opposite impact on me because it has just convinced me even more that uh, it is critical that scientists like myself um, seek to inform the, the public discourse over this issue. Because if we don't, we will leave a vacuum that will readily be filled by the forces of, of misinformation and disinformation. Those with a, you know, their own uh, hidden agenda who have uh, absolutely no interest in acting in the larger public interest. Uh, so I think scientists play a, a key role in trying to make sure that uh, we have an honest debate about this issue. Now, I mean, many scientists themselves feel like they should just report the figures, do their work in the lab, and then leave it to the public entirely with how to understand that knowledge or those findings. Uh, as you've, you've argued in an op-ed in the New York Times, it's not enough for scientists to stay on the sideline. They, they need to, to get involved in communicating that science to the public and its implications. Why do you think that's so important? Yeah, no, th thanks. Th that, um, in fact, it, I, I entitled the op-ed, If You See Something, Say Something. And I was, that's of course a riff off of our uh, Department of Homeland Security. That's a, a motto that they use uh, in uh, compelling the public to, to say something if they see something dangerous or suspicious happening from the standpoint of terror. Um, well, my point is, in choosing that title, is that we scientists see a near and present danger in human-caused climate change. Um, and it is our responsibility to report that to the public. Um, now, that doesn't mean that we have to weigh in, nor should we necessarily weigh in on the specifics of the policy debate. Um, uh, some scientists uh, do. They have very strong opinions about what particular policy interventions should be used to address the issue of climate change. You mean like if we do a carbon tax or exactly. a cap and trade? Or exactly. Um, James Hansen, who I respect greatly, for example, has lobbied uh, fiercely for a revenue neutral carbon tax. So he's very specific about what sort of uh, instrument <laughs> we should use to address the problem. I myself, I don't see myself wanting or, or trying to play that precise a role. Uh, I, I see uh, my role and the and the role of scientists in general as informing the the public discourse, informing the debate, making sure that when uh, when politicians debate the sort of policy prescriptions for dealing with the climate change problem, that it is informed by and embraces uh, what the scientific community has to say about the nature of the problem, the nature of the risks that are involved. Um, I see us uh, in a sense as sort of referees. Um, in making sure that that uh, debate uh, takes place on honest terms. And, um, you know, and I, again, I, I think that if we don't do that, we leave a vacuum which will most certainly be filled by 
uh, the forces of misinformation and disinformation. So we do a disservice to the public if we simply choose to sit out um, on this discussion. So uh, as we mentioned before, you know, it's 2015, uh, the concentration of carbon in the atmosphere is now over 400, uh, something we haven't seen for perhaps millions of, of years. Uh, how much warming have we seen so far? Yeah, we've seen uh, just under a degree Celsius warming um, relative to a, a pre, pre-industrial baseline. Uh, some scientists cite a smaller number because they start at you know, 1850, but there was actually some uh, anthropogenic greenhouse warming before 1850. If, if you go back to 1800 or so um, and try to get a true pre-industrial baseline, it, it's just about a degree Celsius now. Um, and the fact is that most uh, scientists, um, sort of the prevailing view of scientists who study the impacts of climate change um, is that anything more than about two degrees Celsius warming of the planet relative to pre-industrial is where we really start to see the most severe, the most dangerous, um, uh, potentially irreversible changes in, in climate. And, and, and we probably want to do everything we can to avoid warming the planet beyond that truly dangerous limit of, of two degrees Celsius. Well, so we're halfway there already. Um, there's another half a degree or so Celsius probably already in the pipeline, already baked in because of the uh, carbon we've emitted into the atmosphere thus far. It will continue to warm the surface of the earth for, you know, for decades to come, uh, for more than a century. And that means we've probably already committed to at least one and a half degrees C warming. Even, that means e- even if we were to pretty, stop right away? Even if we were to stop emitting carbon now. Um, that means that we really have a pretty small amount of wiggle room, uh, no more than a half a degree Celsius. Uh, we've already emitted well over half of the carbon necessary to commit us to uh, two degrees Celsius warming. And if you extrapolate fossil fuel burning forward under sort of business as usual, where you know, uh, the uh, industrializing countries like uh, India and China and the rest of the developing world start to ramp up their carbon emissions, uh, we, we get there pretty quickly. Um, and so we really have to act now to begin decreasing our emission of carbon if we are going to avoid that two degrees Celsius limit. Uh, there was a recent commentary um, in Nature by uh, a Swiss scientist who basically argued that there's no way we can do it. We should just give up on that target. Uh, I think that sort of thinking is very wrongheaded. It is not supported by the science or by the economics that has been done. Uh, the, the analyses that have been done by leading economists tell us that we can still avoid that warming, but we have to act fairly quickly. Now, there are some very tentative uh, signs of optimism. The fact is uh, that while CO2 has continued to increase in recent years, CO2 is a, is a lagging indicator. What we really need to look at is our emissions of carbon into the atmosphere because it can take several years for those emissions to really be visible in the CO2 record itself. And the, the recent emissions, uh, last year we saw for the first time global economic growth in the face of stagnant carbon emissions. Carbon emissions didn't go up. They actually went slightly down, and yet we we grew the uh, global economy uh, at several percent, um, seeming to suggest the possibility that maybe we are beginning to witness that decarbonification of our economy. um, And efforts like those by Germany to uh, meet an increasingly uh, large market share in their energy market uh, through renewable energy may be starting to pay dividends. Now, we often hear in the public about uh, sort of climate models, and, and that's the the basis of the predictions of like how much warming we can expect based on various tracks of, of our carbon emissions. I mean, at a really basic level, I was wondering, just what does one of these models look like? Um, I mean, there must be just hundreds or thousands of, of inputs and like can you just uh, for a layperson explain what it actually looks like on, on your end? Sure. So uh, you, the models can be anything from the simplest models uh, possible where you just treat the earth as a mathematical point in space and the sun is heating the earth and you calculate how much uh, heating the earth has to produce in response to come into into equilibrium to sort of come into balance with the heating of the sun. Um, it's called an energy balance model. I wrote a, an article in Scientific American last year where I used uh, 
uh, such a simple model to look at uh, different possible future warming scenarios. And it turns out that those really simple models can actually uh, give uh, pretty meaningful results if you're only interested about the global average temperature. So you're using really basic physics of energy and radiation and you can get meaningful answers from those very simple models. On the other hand, if we want to be able to say something about how rainfall patterns and drought patterns in the US or in Europe are going to be impacted by increasing greenhouse gas concentrations, then we need to use far more elaborate models that have the, the relevant physics that resolve you know, the pattern of winds, uh, atmospheric winds uh, that uh, resolve the pattern of ocean currents that resolve the effects of topography of mountain ranges on the behavior of the atmosphere. Right. So I see. So you can see really basically average temperature or average heat in and average heat out kind of and, and what that yeah. would have on the average hole. But the actual impacts in any region, though, that's where it gets much more complicated. Exactly. Um, and in fact, in the real world, we know that um, many of the large impacts of climate are mediated through phenomena like the El Nino phenomenon. Um, uh, El Nino uh, had a profound influence on uh, weather patterns around uh, the world over this past year. This emerging El Nino has uh, influenced rainfall patterns and temperature patterns around the world. And it's a reminder that if we want to really be able to say, you know, how those regional patterns of, of weather will be impacted by climate change, we better be able to say something about how climate change will impact the El Nino phenomenon itself. The El Nino will be one mediator of the impact of human-caused climate change. Yet there's still some uncertainty um, about how precisely El Nino will change because of human-caused climate change. And that has to do with some of the really subtle features of the physics of El Nino. To get El Nino right in a climate model is pretty hard because you've got to get all these uh, various wave disturbances that are in the ocean and the atmosphere that interact, um, the way the ocean and the atmosphere interact with each other, um, the effect of, of, of the trade winds on the ocean surface and of the upwelling of cold water from beneath. And that requires really detailed physics and running models at really high resolution so you can resolve those physics. And that's a challenge even for some of the higher resolution climate models today. So high resolution, what, what does that mean? Yeah, so a high resolution might mean that you take the Earth and you, you know, so all these models break the Earth up into lots of little boxes and they solve the equations of physics and chemistry and biology for each of these boxes and how these boxes interact with each other. And the smaller you make these boxes, the more detail you, you have. But even the most detailed models right now, um, the, the, those individual boxes are typically hundreds, if not a thousand kilometers wide. So that means, for example, that some of these climate models may be lumping in France, Germany, and England into a single box, or here in the U.S., the states of Pennsylvania, New York, and Ohio, and Virginia might be lumped into the same box. Uh, and yet some of the important processes are taking place at a much smaller scale. Um, what's typically done is to introduce uh, what's known as a parameterization, where you acknowledge the physics that you're not able to explicitly resolve because of the scale of your model, and you use some statistical relationship that tells you how the unresolved physics, the physics at the smaller scales, what impact that would likely have on the variables that you're measuring at the scale you are resolving. It's called a parameterization, and the fact is that there are different reasonable ways to parameterize certain processes, including, for example, clouds and different climate models that make different reasonable assumptions of those cloud parameterizations come to slightly or sometimes substantially different answers. Right, because we, we don't know the, the exact effect in the, in the real world. That's, that's right. And we're, you know, getting a better and better sense of that. And we do have answers to the big questions global warming is happening, it's caused by human activity, it's going to be problematic, it already is. We can answer those questions. But if we are to try to inform stakeholders of particular nations or, or states what sort of um, adaptations they're going to need to make in terms of their agricultural um, activities or their heat demand or anything else, um, the sorts of detailed answers we need to be able to give them, we are still often challenged in providing. 
And, and why is that? At a, at a, just ask it very naively. Like, why can't you make those boxes or that resolution just higher? Well, that, that's what we're, we're, we're doing. Uh, it turns out that, um, believe it or not, when you start running the atmosphere at a really high resolution and it's coupled to an ocean model that's run at a really high resolution and you're doing all the chemistry at a really high resolution and you're resolving the stratosphere and the mesosphere and the entire vertical structure of our atmosphere at really high resolution, even for our fastest supercomputers right now, um, those sorts of calculations begin to be pretty taxing. So we are still limited in terms of how high a resolution we can run these models at and still, you know, run them efficiently, still get answers out of them. Um, but that's, you know, as computer technology improves, we are seeing similar improvements in how detailed uh, a job we can do with these climate models. And, and so once you run them in the computer, I mean, well, what do you get? Is it just like a, a gigantic sheet of numbers? Is it, is it a visualization that you can, can run? What does the end result look like? Yeah, so you, you get, you know, ultimately the computer model is going to give you numbers, uh, but just like, uh, you know, a weather model would give you numbers, a weather model would give you a distribution of temperatures and pressures, surface pressures and all sorts of variables, and then you render those numbers using some sort of appropriate graphics interface, you produce pretty plots or animations. Um, it's no different with a climate model, uh, just like a numerical weather forecasting model, the same model that ultimately underlies the, the pretty pictures we see on the nightly weather reports on, on uh, television screens. Um, we can do the same thing with climate models. Uh, we take all those numbers and we turn them into plots, fields, um, graphs that uh, tell us about how these things are changing. And so when people point at California, for example, and the drought happening there, can we say that sort of thing is from climate change? So uh, I'm among, a, a, I think, an increasingly large group of climate scientists who very much think that we can see the fingerprint of human-caused climate change in the current California drought. And there's been some debate in the scientific literature. Uh, I think that uh, some who have argued that we can't yet see the human fingerprint have, have used flawed reasoning. They will, for example, just look at the precipitation. But that isn't the only thing that contributes to drought. California has had its warmest year on record, and warmer temperatures uh, mean more evaporation of water from the soils, means earlier melting of any snowfall accumulation. And so the unusual warmth almost certainly is contributing to the intensity and duration of this drought. I think it's pretty clear that this drought was made worse by human-caused climate change. And it isn't coincidental that the that this current uh, California drought, as some of the paleoclimate specialists tell us, is probably the worst in at least 1,200 years. I don't think that's a, co a coincidence. I think we do see the fingerprint of human influence in this drought. And it, it's a picture. Uh, it, it paints a, a pretty dire picture of, of what's to come if we don't confront, if we don't tackle this problem now. Do you think it's one of those maybe sad things in that we actually have to see something in order to have the, the will to do something about this? Well, unfortunately, there are examples, many examples, history is perhaps replete with examples of where we wait until a problem becomes um, extreme, acute, before we act. Um, and one can point, for example, to you know, the pollution, uh, air pollution and water pollution uh, back in the 1970s. You know, we, we allowed the dumping of toxic chemicals into our waterways and it wasn't until the uh, Cuyahoga River in Ohio caught fire that we recognized that, wait a second, something's wrong here. We had to wait until a river caught fire before we recognized that we had gone too far. But we acted. And a similar argument can be made for acid rain or ozone depletion. Yes, we, we let them go too far. We let these problems get worse than we should have. But when we were at the precipice, we acted in time to avert a catastrophe. Uh, we did it then. We can do it again. To those who say, well, there's no way we're going to tackle this problem. There's no way we're going to rise to the occasion. History suggests otherwise. And whether, you know, Hurricane Katrina or Superstorm Sandy or the California drought was our Cuyahoga River moment 
uh, I believe we are we are nearing that, and and I think we are nearing a true tipping point, not in the climate. We may be nearing uh, tipping points in the climate, but the tipping point I'm talking about is a tipping point in the public consciousness, and I think we're nearing one. Uh, and I have some optimism, as do many of my colleagues, going into you know this uh, all important uh, climate summit in uh, Paris later this year. I, I saw a letter that you wrote um, somewhere about uh, this part of this project of how does it make you feel, or um, maybe I'm right. getting that wrong. But do you remember the name of the, the project? I think that's what it's called. It's uh, various climate scientists like myself being asked, you know, sort of emotionally, what, how do we feel about this problem? Yeah. And and, and can you remember what you said? Yeah, I I, I said that I have I, I have a range of emotions. Um, I go through all all of the emotions uh, when I reflect. I mean, I don't always you know. Sometimes I'm just speaking as a scientist, and I'm pretty sober and pretty dry in what I have to say about the science. But there are those other times where I have an opportunity to reflect on you know what does it mean to me as a human being. You know, I'm a scientist, but I'm also a human being, <laughs> like everyone else, a human being who cares about what sort of uh, future we leave behind uh, for our children, grandchildren. I have a nine-year-old daughter. Uh, I don't want to think that. Uh, uh, that we're going to leave behind a, a degraded world for for her and for her children and, and grandchildren. Um, so um, I, I, I reflect on this problem sometimes as a parent um, and and as a citizen who cares about you know our duty to you know to conserve our, our environment, to preserve our environment, to preserve our climate. And uh, in so doing, I go through all of the full range of emotions, disgust and anger. Uh, towards those who are knowingly trying to mislead the public I- into not acting on this threat. Uh, I, um, I feel optimism. Sometimes I'm, ch- I'm cheery <laughs> when I hear good news, um, like the, you know, the fact that we did see this potential beginning of a decoupling between carbon and the economy last year, uh, some, 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 some good news. And there, there, there's other good news out there as well. There are the huge strides that uh, renewable energy is making uh, both abroad and here in the U.S. So sometimes I feel, you know, happiness, joy um, when, when, when I hear some good news. Um, and sometimes I get sad and, and, and pessimistic uh, when I hear bad news. Um, so I guess the emotions I experience are probably not too different from the emotions that uh, uh, people who aren't climate scientists experience when they when they think about the various problems that we face to end off i mean this is a this is a big year this is uh the year that uh the world is again coming together and in terms of paris uh to hopefully find an agreement of some sort um there seems to be some some growing momentum on the one hand on the other you know things things are are really dire how are you feeling going forward yeah i feel cautiously optimistic uh, because there are some good signs out there uh, maybe I'm just an optimistic person, but I think there are legitimate reasons. Um, uh, first of all, we know that there's still time to avoid the worst. Uh, we know there's still time to take the actions necessary. And um, so that that gives me some comfort in knowing as a scientist um, that we still have not yet crossed the point of no return when it comes, for example, to, to you know two degree Celsius warming of the planet. And I'm cautiously optimistic at some of the good signs, uh, the, the positive signs we see going into the, the Paris Accord later this year. Um, and, and it's a real opportunity for meaningful progress. And other people should be similarly optimistic. Uh, it's, they shouldn't be giving up hope. Uh, there's some who, uh, I, I call them p- false prophets, who say it's, it's too late, there's nothing we can do about it, so why bother even worrying? I think that's potentially the most dangerous messaging uh, possible because first of all it's wrong and second of all it doesn't lead to the sorts of behaviors that will allow us to solve this problem so I would say to ordinary people you know out there trying to get a handle on this issue there's still time to make sure that we do avert a catastrophe that we don't you know, basically uh, mortgage uh, the planet for future generations but there is a great urgency of acting now um, to do something about it so, so I guess in the end, it's uh, be worried, but have hope and, and get engaged. Yeah, have a sense of the urgency of acting, but 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 don't be pessimistic because there is time to act. Um, if anything, it should just give you more drive and energy to help with the forward push towards doing something about the problem. Uh, well, Michael Mann, it's been a pleasure talking to you and thanks for all your work on this issue. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, thank you. It was my pleasure talking with you.
That was my conversation with Michael Mann, distinguished professor at Penn State University and the director of the Earth Systems Science Center. And that's all for the first episode of The Elephant, our very first one. The Elephant is made possible with funding by the CKAA, a European society of entrepreneurs, scientists, students, professionals, and policy officers working to create a climate resilient society. Find out more at ckaa.eu. The show is put together by myself, Kevin Kaners, with help from Patrick Chadwick and executive producer Matthias Gutz. Additional thanks this week to Christina Peters, Stefan Lischka, and Martin Hirsch. Our logo was designed by Joseph Nowak. You can find us online at elephantpodcast.org. And we're also on Facebook and Twitter. Our handle is at Elephant Podcast. And if you like the show, if you could write us a review or give us a star rating in iTunes, it would be a big help. I'm Kevin Kaners. See you soon. <laughs>